Haitians are eating cats in Ohio. So what? Cubans have been killing people's horses in Florida for decades now, and nobody really talks about that. I went on Google and I did some research about Cubans mutilating people's horses to eat the meat in the state of Florida, and I found over a hundred stories. It turns out that in the state of Florida, there's even a black market where you can buy stolen horse meat for about $20 a pound. Now, a horse isn't like a cat where you can just grab it and take it with you. Most of these cases involving horses is where they find a horse in a field somewhere and they just take a section of the horse and leave the horse there. Well, the process is too graphic to describe, but the general idea is that these groups of armed Cubans go find a horse and they don't take the whole horse because you can't take a whole horse. It's almost impossible unless you have a trailer and equipment. So they go for the hind legs or any specific cut of the horse that is the most valuable, leaving the rest of the horse there on the property for the owners to find. Many of these horses have been people's thoroughbred racing horses that are worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. Others are emotional pet horses. Others are just people's pets. And some of these horses have even been therapy horses that are used to help people recovering from post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, with hundreds of these horse mutilating stories coming out of Florida, wouldn't you think that would be a better headline than Haitian steal somebody's cat? Of course it would. The problem is that Cubans in Florida tend to vote Republican. And despite all of their uncouth cultural antics, many people in the state of Florida tolerate it because after all, they vote the same way they do. Apart from just going after horses, Cubans also practice a type of religion that requires animal sacrifices. Predominantly, chickens and goats are used for these services. And just like there's hundreds of stories about Cubans killing horses for the meat to sell it on a black market, there's also hundreds of stories in South Florida about people finding headless goats and headless chickens in canals and around their properties. So this isn't a problem that just affects Haitian communities. A lot of immigrant groups come from other countries with cultural practices that are looked at as unacceptable in the United States. So why is there so much focus on Haitians in Ohio? Now a graphic news report out of North Fort Myers shares a story about a couple. Here's their photo. And what they did is that they had a pet dog. Now the pet dog became part of their relationship and they recorded it and they were caught on, well, they, they had video evidence of what they were doing with their dog. Now, the details are again too graphic to explain, but stories like this about people doing strange and weird things with their pets, questionable things, sometimes even recording it on video and putting it on the internet, are not out of the realm of normality. If you went on the internet, I'm sure you could find hundreds of stories of people were arrested for doing the same exact thing with their pets. So with so much rampant abuse of animals in the United States, why does this story about Haitians captivate America? Then we also have people who've been arrested for looking for dogs and cats for dog fighting rings. And we know the way they use those animals as well. So animal abuse in the United States is absolutely rampant. So again, with so many horrific stories about people who are American or Cuban doing horrific things to animals, why is it that we're focusing on this one situation with Haitians in Ohio? Clearly, these aren't the most atrocious things that are happening in the United States, but they sure are the most newsworthy. Why? So now we're going to assume that all Americans are doing stuff like this with their dogs because a couple in North Fort Myers decided to do that with their dog? Well, that would be unreasonable, and it would also be unreasonable for us to assume that all Haitians are out there looking for people's cats to eat them. And even then, in the state of Florida, we have black markets where you can go and buy horse meat for $20 a pound. And for $150 a pound, you can get your hands on some sea turtle meat. Now this stuff is white, flaky. It's got the texture of like a, like a filet mignon, but it tastes like fish. If you've never had sea turtle meat, uh, I, I, that's what I've heard. So what if I eat sea turtle in my native country of Cuba? I don't do it here in the United States because it's illegal here. Alabama saw one of our subscribers comments that people in Alabama eat rabbits, squirrels, and even roadside kills like possums and raccoons. So a cat wouldn't be too far of a fetch. 
Another one of our subscribers says that in Appalachia, people eat rabbits, gator, snakes, and really any critter that wanders up in those mountains gets eaten by the locals in Appalachia. So he thinks it's not a big deal that people are eating cats. He says in Appalachia, we eat all types of critters. Smiley face. I mean, crap, right across the street from where I live, there's a Japanese restaurant. People eat raw fish and they get worms from it. Very nasty infestations of worms that you have to deworm yourself and you get sick afterwards. Uh, I don't personally eat that, but uh, my wife has been known to catch a few worm infestations here and there. People eat all types of weird crap. So what's the big deal with somebody eating a freaking cat? It may not be your type of meat, but it's somebody's type of meat because they're eating it. And if they are, so what? It's their culture. Of course, you shouldn't be eating people's pets and stealing them. But again, what's worse, a cat or a horse? Now, a horse is an animal that has nervous system-wise a lot more endings. It has a lot more pain. Uh, we used to own horses in Cuba, and let me explain something to you about horses. Among all the animals, the animal that is the most sensitive to pain happens to be the horse. A lot of animals don't really have a lot of pain nerve endings. Take fish, for example. But horses are among the animals that are the most sensitive to pain. And we know that because we used to have horses in Cuba. We it slept inside our house. It didn't sleep outside because if we left it outside at night, people would come and steal it. We used to have to bring the horse inside the house in Cuba. And that is how close we were to our horses. And horses are animals that are very sensitive. So when you hear the stories about people taking a leg off a horse and leaving it there, it's a very painful experience. It would feel as much pain as, let's say, a human going through the same experience. So basically, there's levels of atrocious behavior towards animals that are far more sensitive in nature than what these Haitians are doing with these cats in Ohio. There's all types of misappropriation, and we could even say in some cases, at least they're eating the animals. With some of these animal rituals, they're not even eating the animals. They're just leaving them in a ditch or in a canal somewhere in Lehigh or Cape Coral to be found by people walking their dogs in the community. So with all these horrific examples of mostly migrant groups and as well Americans, U.S. citizens, doing atrocious things with their dog down there in North Fort Myers and recording it for the, for the doggy web, uh, you know, there's horrible examples. So again... That raises a question, why Springfield, Ohio? Why? What's really happening there? We're going to get to it. On today's video, I'm going to bring you guys some information so you can better understand what is happening in Springfield, Ohio with the Haitian migrants. If you're not familiar with Springfield, Ohio, it's a rundown town north of Dayton and Cincinnati. They have lost over 20,000 people since the 1950s and about 25% of their population lives in poverty. Now, you would think because there's so much poverty here that there aren't any jobs or opportunities. Well, in today's video, I'm going to show you that there are jobs, there are opportunities. So it turns out that Haitians aren't moving to Springfield, Ohio. It turns out that companies are actually transferring workers to this town because the local labor force is unreliable, lacy, and complacent. Now this scenario plays out across much of rural America, and on today's video, I'm gonna show you not just Springfield, Ohio, but a few other towns in the United States that are having the same exact problem. The locals upset that the companies don't wanna hire the local labor force, but they wanna bring people from other places that are more reliable, less likely to get injured and try to sue them. We're going to start off with looking at several towns in the United States. First, we're going to talk about Springfield, but then we're going to move on to a few other towns in the United States. So you guys can understand that this isn't just happening in Ohio. It's happening across America. Now, this story stems from the racist stereotype that Haitians eat cats. It's completely unfounded. And while it may happen in remote cases, it is usually some type of racial derogatory story that is told about Haitians to scare people about them. Something similar to like the Salem witchcraft. Where defaming stories are passed down about an ethnicity or group of people to make sure that other people go after them in a discriminatory way. It's basically the same exact thing. So it turns out there's actually a crap load of jobs in Springfield, Ohio. But the locals are lazy and don't want to take advantage of it. This is one of the many distribution centers 
that they have in this town. As you can see, somebody took this photo. They couldn't believe how dirty this uh, port here is for this distribution center in Springfield, Ohio. So I go on Indeed, and there are over 600 jobs in Springfield, Ohio, a town of less than 60,000 people. Lehigh Acres, Florida has three times that population, and they only have 100 job openings. Now, while jobs seem to pay about the same in both cities, living in Lehigh Acres, your rent will be at least twice as much. A house in Lehigh Acres right now is starting at about $300,000, and the average house in Springfield, Ohio, is about $114,000. So housing is at least twice as much. Jobs pay about the same. But in Lehigh Acres, Florida, there are considerably less jobs. I mean, there's five times more jobs in Springfield, Ohio, but they have a third of the population. So do the math on how much harder it is to get a job in Lehigh Acres. Now here's Lehigh Acres, highlighted in purple is the percentage of the city that's dedicated to commercial and industrial purposes. Here's Springfield, Ohio, and you can see that the city is covered with industrial commercial applications and land use. The options here are bountifully more plentiful than in a place like Lehigh Acres, Florida that is more expensive and has less jobs. The reason why this town has a high poverty rate is because the people here have their houses paid off, their cars are old, they're not brand new, they don't want to work, a lot of them are getting SSI, this area of the country has the highest percentage of food stamps per capita of anywhere in the country, these people are simply SSI disabled, living off the government, getting food stamps, they don't need to work, their houses are paid off, their cars are old. These people here have high poverty rates because they don't want to participate in the labor force. And now these companies and distribution centers are dying. They can't find workers. So they're bringing migrants from Haiti to work in these plants because they know they're reliable, they're hardworking. They're not trying to leech off the system. They're trying to work. So of course, if you have a company and all these lazy people, a lot of them are going to try to sue you. A lot of them are going to try to get hurt on the job sites. A lot of them are very unreliable. The addiction rates up here are three times the national average. This is an unreliable labor force. So you bring all these Haitian migrants and they are hungry to work. They are eager to work. So of course, the local labor force hates these Haitian migrants because they're actually willing to work. They're actually trying to get these jobs and they're actually showing up to work on time. And this isn't a scenario unique to Springfield, Ohio. My goodness. I'm going to give you guys a list of other American towns that have the same exact problem. Yeah, people, we have 600,000 Haitians in the state of Florida. Do we have any of these problems with Haitians here? Absolutely not. The problem is that these people in Ohio don't want to work. And these migrants that are going there, like the Haitians make them look bad of course they hate these haitian migrants they're actually willing to work they're not trying to be leeching off the system they don't need to be put in a rehab center the only thing they need is a job and a place they can pay rent and they figure it out so the real reason these people in springfield ohio are upset is because they're lazy they're leeching off the system they are leaving the companies that have invested in infrastructure here and distribution centers with absolutely no labor force they can rely on. If you look at the ratings of the distribution centers in this town, they're some of the worst in the country. And the reason is because the people here don't want to work. They've been systematically exploiting these companies. So, of course, the companies are going to be like, you know what? Forget it. We're not going to hire you guys. We're going to bring people from somewhere else. And that is what's at the core of this problem. And look, this isn't rocket science. The same exact thing happened with Mexicans. Companies didn't want to hire Americans because the Mexicans were better. Construction, industries, they didn't want American workers. They wanted Mexican workers because they were more reliable. So Americans created an anti-Mexican campaign. And we all know what happened with the Mexicans. They work harder. They're more reliable. They're more productive. Companies wanted them. It made the American workers jealous. And it became a problem in the labor force. And it segregated the labor force where now people that are Mexican, they have to live in a place like Texas, California, New York, or Florida, where they have large communities. They can't just go now and work in a small town in the middle of the Midwest because the people there are going to make their lives miserable because they don't want those people there because they're more productive. This isn't a new thing in the United States. It's been happening forever. And what's happening in Springfield, Ohio now is that they're trying to start a misinformation campaign against the Haitian community because they don't like them. But it's not because they're eating people's cats. It's because they're hardworking people that 
are actually willing to take these jobs. And that's the last thing people in Ohio want in their community. Coleman, Alabama has the same exact problem. There's a huge Walmart distribution center and they can't get local people in Alabama to work here. So what has Walmart done? They grab black people from Louisiana and Mississippi and Spanish people from Florida and they pay them extra money to come work at the Coleman Distribution Center. Here's a distribution center for the South, one of the biggest. It's a very important distribution center, but they can't rely on the local labor force. They drag their feet. Their production is absolutely minimal and horrible. And this isn't a secret. A lot of people in America work for Walmart. They can verify what I'm saying is very accurate. The Coleman Distribution Center has a problem that the local labor force is lazy, unreliable, and they're very propensed to get hurt on the job sites. Thus, the people that are having to run these companies are usually people from Mississippi, Louisiana, or from Florida that temporarily get transferred here so things can get done. And those crews, you'll have like 2,000 people from Alabama and 50 people from Florida or Mississippi. And the crews from Florida, Mississippi in a day, despite being 10% of the actual population of the labor force, sometimes will com complete as much as two to three times more work than those crews from Coleman, Alabama. They are lazy people again, these are areas that are predominantly white population, and they simply want to abuse and get every drop of blood they can out of these companies. And these big warehouses and distribution centers need productivity. I've known several people from Florida who get transferred to Coleman, Alabama, and they can be there for a month or two because after a while they have motorcycle gangs that target the workers and try to scare them, or they won't serve them at restaurants. It's like a complete... Uh, I don't know, persecution of the workers from other states that are at that facility. And it's basically that the local labor force here simply does everything they can to keep these workers from other states out because they're more productive. So the problem arises in areas that have very small percentages of foreign born population, places like Ohio, places like Alabama, West Virginia, these large distribution centers and hubs that employ a lot of people they can't rely on the local labor force, not because there aren't people there, there aren't bodies there that can work, because the people that are there are simply unreliable and they're too much of a liability. Coleman, Alabama being a perfect and well-documented example of an area where there are a lot of jobs, but they have to bring workers from other places. And this is again happening across America. And these towns are usually going to start all types of rumors and and misinformation campaigns, anything they can do to taint the reputation of these people because they want to keep them out of their communities. Russellville, Alabama has more Latinos by percentage of the population of anywhere in the state of Alabama. It's around 40% of the population. Now, this is an impoverished, poor area in the northwest side of Alabama. There really isn't much going on here. But in Russellville, you have a huge Latino community that works in the chicken plants. And again, here's a huge industry, and the only labor force that they can find is Hispanics and Latinos. Predominantly here, you have a lot of people from Guatemala, and they are the ones that mostly are working in these industries. These are places that if you move there with the desire to work, you can generate a lot of income. Now, as you guys know, I lived in rural Alabama, and while living in rural Alabama, I made a lot of money. It was considerably easier to make money in rural Alabama. Despite the fact that it was easier to make money while living in Alabama, I had to leave due to discrimination and racial and ethnic persecution. Now, at the time that this happened, a lot of people said it wasn't true and I was lying. But we've seen in the last year several, if not dozens, of cases of Hispanics in Alabama that are being targeted by criminals and simply just killed because they're Hispanics, because the criminals know that law enforcement doesn't investigate criminal cases if the victim is Hispanic. Particularly the cities of Birmingham and Montgomery have each had killings. Basically, the criminals are going on a complete free-for-all, what they call a green light in Alabama, which you can just go out there and whack anybody you want as long as they're a minority Hispanic because they know the cops are not going to investigate it. This has created a situation where it's become almost impossible for Latinos to exist in the cities of Montgomery and Birmingham because they're constantly being targeted by criminals. And you have the same exact scenario. This is what they call the black jobs. Remember a while back they were talking about black jobs? Basically, if you are moving to these parts of Alabama, 
there's a lot of work. There's a lot of opportunity. Now, the vast majority of the population here is in poverty, not because there aren't opportunities. It's that they don't want to work. There are plentiful options for work. There are plentiful opportunities. But the people of Alabama, both the blacks and the whites, and the whites were talking to rural communities and the blacks were talking Montgomery and Birmingham, want to keep immigrant groups out because they don't want that competition. And a lot of times it becomes violent. It isn't just a defamation campaign like in Ohio. In the case of Alabama, it's become violent. It's become scary and dangerous to be a minority in these places because the black gangs go after you to rob you and the white law enforcement smiles when it happens because they don't want these people there. Mutual resentment against migrants from the whites and the blacks in the state of Alabama. It all revolves around the labor force. And again, I lived in rural Alabama. The opportunities were boundless. I made more money the year that I lived in Alabama than I have my entire life. Meanwhile, everybody around me in Alabama was starving and complaining and wondering when they were going to get another stimulus check from COVID because these people systematically exploit the system. If they go to work, then they can't get their food stamps. Doe B, a famous artist from Montgomery, Alabama, is quoted for saying, to me, the first of the month is like a holiday. And if you've lived in Alabama, you know what I'm talking about. In these places in rural America that are 5% or less foreign-born population, the f these people, the first of the month is like a holiday to these people. It's a sacred day for these people, the first of the month. And the trap houses and the dealers... They make songs about the first of the month. You guys remember that song from Bone Thugs and Harmony? It's the first of the month. It's the first of the month. People are singing welfare carols in these states. I'm, they're, they're, they're just immersed in a culture of living off the government. So, of course, they hate and demonize these immigrant groups who come here to work and raise their families and are not interested in a hangout. Not ever. I live here in the state of Florida, 600,000 Haitians. I have never in my life interviewed a single Haitian that's homeless on the streets of Florida. I've never in my life seen a single Haitian panhandling in the state of Florida. In fact, there's videos on the internet of Haitians that get caught panhandling and they get beat up by their own people. There's also videos out of Miami where the local gangs are beating up Hispanics if they're caught homeless or on the streets or panhandling, the gangs actually beat the people up. They say, hey, we're not white. There's no panhandling. There's no homeless people here. In the city of Hialeah, they were arresting police officers because they were beating up the homeless, telling the homeless, hey, we're not Americans. We're Cubans. You can't be homeless here. You can't be panhandling here. This, this, isn't, uh, this isn't Alabama. This is Florida. There's no panhandling here. So it's people that have a culture where even among their own people, they self-patrol. And in the case of Florida, I have never seen a Haitian panhandling. I have never seen a Haitian homeless. That doesn't happen. If it's happening up here, it's because they're just not opening the doors. Um, in the case of uh, Springfield, Ohio, 30% uh, of the black population is um, in poverty. 40% of the Hispanic population is in poverty. 89% of the Native American population is in poverty. So clearly, they're racially discriminating people there to where they don't have options. They might have to eat a freaking cat. They might have to panhandle because they're not given opportunities. But if you give these people opportunities, man, these people have work ethic. Now, this is southern Georgia. Now, most of the state is white. That's featured in blue. The areas in green are the black population. You can see like larger cities like uh, Albany and Valdosta are going to have black populations. That's the way most of the south is. But you see those areas of orange? That is Hispanic. You can see around the town of Moultrie, a large Hispanic community has been growing. Despite the fact that all of South Georgia is struggling, these towns in South Georgia have high poverty rates. Populations don't grow, they decrease. I mean, it's part of the Deep South. It's, it's a dying part of America. High crime rates, high homicide rates, all the horrible things that you know about the Deep South exist here. Uh, South Georgia also had a lot of people that died with COVID disproportionately at rates like 30 times higher than other places people died from COVID because they refused to get vaccinated. So that's just to give you an idea that this is a failing, dying place. Population loss, 
incomes are low, poverty is high. But here in Moultrie, Georgia, there's a growing Cuban community. And now much of the outskirts of Moultrie are starting to flourish. Rent prices have gone up. Business centers are busy. Uh, companies are finding workers because a emerging uh, community of people from South Florida started to move to Moultrie and to create a small Latino community. And now Moultrie, Georgia is starting to thrive. You're starting to see businesses open. You're starting to see new businesses open. You're starting to see companies being able to find workers. You're starting to see the town of Moultrie, Georgia be like a shining star in Southern Georgia while all of the other surrounding communities are dying. All that because a small group of Latinos moved here and they were able to kickstart the economy and the community of Cubans predominantly and other Latinos that are moving here have kickstarted the economy. And while most of these towns in South Georgia are dying, struggling, full of crime, losing population, businesses and houses are getting abandoned and closed, Moultrie, Georgia is very successful today, continues to emerge from poverty, and it's a nice growing town because they welcomed a Latino community. And it's thriving. It's been great for this town. And it's another example of if you allow people to come in and create communities, they make great communities. When you compare Moultrie, Georgia to the surrounding towns in South Georgia, it doesn't even feel like it's the same state. Moultrie, Georgia, you see people downtown. You see businesses open. You see like life, activity, and economy when you leave Moultrie, Georgia, and you go to the other towns that are surrounding it, you see abandoned buildings, poverty, and misery. Moultrie, Georgia is a perfect example of what happens to a town when you let minority groups move in that are hungry and desire to do something better with their lives. A lot of people that came here from Miami bought houses cash, and a lot of them even work night shifts at chicken plants, very difficult work that other people simply don't want to do. But that's contributed so much to the economy here that now Moultrie is a nice, beautiful little town in South Georgia, while the surrounding South Georgia, we know what it looks like. You know, they want to put out this narrative that these migrant groups destroy these communities. Dalton, Georgia is one of the nicest cities in Georgia. Moultrie, Georgia is one of the nicest small rural towns in the southern part of the state. In the case of Alabama, the areas that have the highest Latino population, Guntersville, Boas, Albertville, these areas of, of Alabama are thriving. Huntsville, Alabama is the most diverse city in Alabama, and it is a leading economical powerhouse in the South right now. Birmingham and Montgomery and Mobile don't want to welcome migrants. Those towns are among the worst in the country. Then you get to northern Alabama where you have Huntsville, a more diverse city in the South, and it's absolutely one of the best cities that you have in the entire state of Alabama where things are actually moving in the right direction. So this whole notion that migrant groups destroy towns in America, where are you getting this from? It doesn't line up with, it doesn't, it's not the case in Alabama. It's not the case in Florida. It's not the case in Georgia. It's not the case in Arkansas. This is Springdale, Arkansas. Now, the state of Arkansas is another misery and failure of a state. The southeastern and eastern part of Arkansas, there's counties where the homicide rate, rural counties, not urban counties, rural counties where the homicide rate is over 100 per 100,000. That's on par with like uh, Tijuana, Mexico, for example, the most dangerous city in the world. That exists in rural Arkansas. But then... You get to the extreme northwest Arkansas. Towns like Benton, Bentonville, Springdale, Rogers, all these towns. Uh, Asylum Springs is another one. We all know that the best part of Arkansas is northwest Arkansas. Again, the area around Fayetteville, this area has the most growth of anywhere in the state of Arkansas. Here's the state of Arkansas. It's dying high crime rates, high unemployment rates, high homicide rates, everything horrible is happening in Arkansas. Then in the northwest corner, you have this area that is thriving. In fact, we all know that northwest Arkansas is one of the fastest growing and best places to move in America. What's different about northwest Arkansas? When you look at the rest of Arkansas and what they're growing through, right? And then you look at northwest Arkansas where they're growing, they're building, and everything's going, what, what is different about Northwest Arkansas? Let me show you. You see all that orange 
right there in the heart of Northwest Arkansas, that's all a Hispanic community. And the red is an Asian community. I believe it's people from like Pacific Islands. They also have a huge presence here as well. This is Rogers, Arkansas. It's in the Northwest side of Arkansas. Now, as we know, Walmart is from Arkansas. It's from this particular area, Benton, Bentonville. This is the land of Walmart. So what does Walmart do? Well, it created a large, diverse community in Northwest Arkansas. And what are the results? Well, success. While Arkansas is a state losing population with high crime rates, Northwest Arkansas is one of the best places to live in the United States. Why? Because they're also the most diverse region in the state of Arkansas. This influx of migrants was the backbone for all the construction, all the growth, and all the economical powerhouse on which all that growth that this area has seen lies on. Arkansas is a very backward state. It's a state that keeps people out. They're backwards. They hate outsiders. And the results show when you look at the analytics of their state. The only shining star in the state of Arkansas is the northwest corner, which also happens to be the part of Arkansas that has migrant people there. It was on their backs that all the success was built. And it's benefited Arkansas because now they have, in the northwest side of the state, a successful metropolitan area. Let me tell you, if you go to Little Rock, it is not the same situation there. Yeah, Little Rock is another black jobs area. We want to preserve our black jobs. Well, those black jobs aren't doing anything for anybody. If they had immigrant jobs, they'd be successful like Bentonville and Fayetteville and all the other northwest side of Arkansas. But there's a clear difference between Fayetteville and Little Rock. What's the clear difference? Well, Little Rock doesn't have those migrant communities. Northwest Arkansas does. So it isn't just one example here or there. We can go state by state and talk about the contribution that these groups have had to their states in a positive way. The people that are trying to tell people that these migrant groups are hurting America are actually very uninformed. The truth is the complete opposite, that actually states that are struggling when migrant groups move in is when things actually start to pick up. This is Salem Springs, Arkansas. It's a small little town in rural Arkansas. The population is 26% Latino. As you can see, businesses are open here and there is economical activity. For a small town in Arkansas, that says quite a bit because most small towns in Arkansas are complete devoid ghost towns. Take Harrison, Arkansas, known to be one of the most racist places in America. Their businesses are closed, houses are abandoned, and you don't see any new construction. But again, in this part of Arkansas, it's clear what the Hispanic labor force has done for this area. Arkansas is an undeniable example of a state where immigrant groups have created the best communities in the state and the areas that are the most devoid, where less than 5% of the population is foreign born. Those counties have homicide rates on par with Tijuana, Mexico. But then you come here to the area where the Latino community makes up 26, 30, 40% of the population and you have some of the fastest growing cities, not just in Arkansas, but among the fastest cities in the country. So it's undeniable and it's clear that these migrant groups are needed. And you know what? These big corporations are not stupid. Sure, the American people can believe whatever the crap they want, but the only thing that these big corporations care about is the bottom line. And for the bottom line, you need people that are willing to work. And today in the United States of America, people aren't willing to work. They're willing to shoot up. They're willing to sign up for food stamps. They're willing to pretend they got a disability to get an SSI check, but they sure as crap don't want to work. Look how beautiful Salem Springs, Arkansas looks compared to the rest of the state. Look at this. Look how beautiful this community is. It's thriving. It's full of life. Businesses are open. Food trucks, people out and about, a packed and busy downtown. Do you think the parts of Arkansas that are 97% white have towns like this where there's life and business and economy. Dude, those towns are freaking dead. They're ghost towns. They're abandoned. But yeah, when you compare a town like Salem Springs like this, nice downtown people out and about, businesses, uh, the roads don't have eight-foot potholes, and the cars are nice and new, the buildings are painted, the businesses are open. You don't see that in Arkansas today. And you know who benefits the most from this? The white people. The white people here are so happy. You walk into a restaurant and they're happy. They're smiling. They're nice and fat. They're chubby. Their cheeks are red and squishy. You see the white people here and they are adorable. They're happy. 
if they were to end up in a foster care or I don't know what do they call these things, uh, the, the old people houses, nursing homes, or whatever, when they get old, when they end up in the nursing home, they have somebody to take care of them, to be their friend. Can you imagine if you are elderly and you end up in a nursing home in West Virginia? What type of care do you think you're going to get in a place like that? Not very good care. But in places like this, the white population is happy and healthy. Go to Harrison, Arkansas, and they're hostile. They're angry. They got political posters all over their vehicles. They're just angry and frustrated at the world. And they're living bad. If they end up in a nursing home there, they're not going to have anybody to take care of them. They're miserable. They're miserable people because they don't have people in their community. They're not seeing people live dreams and be successful. They're just seeing the same old thing day after day. What a life. This is Montura Ranch, Florida. It's about 80% Hispanic. It's a rural area. Now, there's nothing out here. I mean, there's houses, and then that's, I think they have a Cuban store and a gas station. That's it. It's about 80% Hispanic. Um, most of the people here are going to be Cubans and Venezuelans. Uh, and just every Brazilian, Argentinian, everything from Miami here. Now, it's a beautiful community. I started a Facebook group for Montour Ranch. It's called like Montour Ranch Free Stuff. It was to help this community. I started this Facebook group to help this community. I don't even have to moderate this Facebook group. And I have many Facebook groups, and they're a nightmare. I run Naples, Florida, Uncensored. I have to be on top of these groups nonstop. There's scam. There's fraud. Now, I also have Latinos of Alabama, which is up at over 10,000 people. It's a nightmare. Um... There I have to deal with people scamming, selling illegal sales, everything that, the most horrendous Facebook group ever. This is Montour Ranch. I started a Facebook group to help people here. It was called Montour Ranch Free Stuff or whatever. And uh, I don't even have to manage the Facebook group. It literally manages itself. People post uh, animals for sale. They, uh, they post what's ever happening in their community. Recently, I guess they flooded in the last week and people are posting pictures of the floods. It's a group of like 4,000 people now, and I have to do nothing to manage the group. It literally runs itself. I let the people do whatever they want. Every once in a while, somebody gets flagged, but they run their own group. And uh, it's mostly 1.25 acres you buy out here. They were going for about $35,000. People keep flipping and whatever. But it's like a rural community, and uh, it's mostly Hispanic. Now, there's nothing in this community. If you want a barber, there are barbers, but you have to know the person that cuts hair in their backyard, for example. If you need anything, they have everything, but it's not like a business. It's a person that does it for you. But you know, there's people that sell food on the side. There's people that cut hair on the side and endlessly. There's all types of services that people provide, but it's like, you know, it's like a small little rural community. They have nothing. Like I said, they got a gas station and a Cuban store. That's all they really got out here. There's nothing in Montura Ranch and it's far out in Henry County near Clewiston and Immokalee. Now, the biggest problem that this area has is theft. You can see that even empty lots have fences. Uh, that's a huge problem here. Uh, criminal groups out of Miami are moving in and they victimize anything. They steal cars, they steal trucks, they steal semi-trucks, equipment, heavy equipment. Animals, even fencing and materials get stolen here. Animal theft is out of control here. And uh, unfortunately, much of the animal theft revolves around stuff like horses and goats. And we have already talked about what they're doing with those animals sometimes. So it's a pretty crappy situation. As you can see, uh, most of the houses are fenced in, six-foot fences. You don't really see a lot of six-foot fences in rural America, but you do see it here. Um, the Montour Ranch is a, a strange example of a community of mostly Latinos in a rural area in America. It doesn't really exist in too many places. Um, and it's a great, successful community. Um, it's got some issues. Over the years, I've had American acquaintances that live out here, and they absolutely love it. They love the community. They all work out. They look out for each other, and it's, it's a great rural community. I said I know Americans that are like veterans and stuff that live out here, and they absolutely love living in Montura Ranch. Uh, over the years, uh, there's been they used to have a lot of like whites that were meffed out, but a lot of those have kind of moved out. I think they're like the minority now if they even exist. Um, you know, there's issues here with this rural Latino community. It's not perfect. Um, but overall, they're building, they're growing, and you know, economically, it's always something going on. There's always somebody clearing a lot, somebody buying animals, somebody bringing in equipment, somebody's always doing something, fixing up the land, preparing land, buying animals. People are always doing something in this rural community, um, but it just seems that they don't get the support 
like you know the infrastructure that other places would get. Uh, rural communities, they don't seem to get the same support from public services. Um, it, it becomes a difficult situation to manage um, because, uh, you know, it's, it's, I, I don't even know how to word it. But uh, there are rural communities that are just Hispanics, and they, they have their problems too. Um, and, you know, animal theft is a problem in these communities. I don't think it's the Haitians. There are some Haitians and Jamaicans out here, but I don't think it's them. Uh, it's mostly people for rituals who believe uh, whatever purpose it serves. And then you also have the people, again, going after the horses. Does that mean that this community is a failure or it's horrible? No, they're hardworking country people like everybody else. And um, they're very industrious people. I mean, I go on this Facebook group from Montreal Ranch, and I can't believe how many animals they sell. People, they grow plants. They provide services for other people that have animals. I mean... It's an industrious group of people. Unfortunately, they're plagued with a lot of theft. Um, and I guess that's one of the downsides of this particular community. But I have to admire the, the industriousness, you know. Uh, you go to other rural communities in Florida, nobody's growing animals and chickens and goats. Bro, I go to this Facebook group and it's incredible what they got going on here. But there it is. That is the real situation in the United States with these migrant groups like the Haitians. Yeah, they're trying to put them out as cat eaters and stuff like that. But the reality is that the reason they're ending up in these remote places in the middle of nowhere is because they need the work. Uh, I can think about a few other towns, uh, Norman uh, in Oklahoma. But there's examples all over the country of, you know, growing in emergent immigrant communities in rural America. And they turn out to be great places. Uh, they have different challenges than American communities. Uh, there's definitely no drug addiction. There's definitely no overdoses. Uh, so the problems that plague and endemically plague Americans, you know, don't plague these communities. For example, the Latin community here is plagued with theft. You can see all the fencing everywhere, but they don't have drug addiction. So it's Every ethnic group has their own behaviors and characteristics and practices, and everybody's different in their own way, and you can find horrible things to say about white people, um, you know, but does that mean that all white people are like that? Are you kidding me? You see all these dying towns in West Virginia and some parts of Alabama and the Deep South and all these towns that are dying in Arkansas. If you grabbed Haitians and Guatemalans and let them move into these towns, in six to seven years, the population would have grown 30%. The income would have risen by 60%. There would be businesses open. There would be more stores. Houses that were abandoned would be being rebuilt and remodeled. Businesses that were closed and decaying would be thriving and packed with people. If you grab a town in West Virginia right now that's been losing population or eastern Kentucky, the coal mine towns, they say, oh, we, we lost the coal mines. We'll never be able to do anything again. Bro, are you kidding me? Look at this. This is freaking, look, the bears come and, and tear apart people's garbage cans out here. This is the middle of the Everglades. And these people in the middle of the Everglades are farming, growing fruits, and share crop. I don't know what the crap they're doing out there. They're doing something to survive. They're making it work. And there's nothing in Montour Ranch. Nothing. But they're making it work somehow. So... All these situations that you see in the United States where people are talking about, oh, we lost the coal mine, so we'll never be in. Dude, grab some Guatemalans and grab some Haitians and put them in these towns in eastern Kentucky and West Virginia that are dying and, and give them seven or eight years and watch those towns turn around. This is the United States of America. People die. People die just to touch American soil. And they don't get a driver's license when they get here. They don't get an ID. They don't get a social security number. They're here illegally. And they risk their lives to come to this country illegally just to get a small taste of this country. So when you see all these towns in eastern K Kentucky and West Virginia and southern Ohio, and they're starving and their poverty rates are 30% of the population, it's because they don't want to work. This is the United States of America. There is opportunity even in the most miserable places. I've lived in rural Alabama and there were opportunities for me because I made the opportunity. But if you ask the locals, 
They're going to tell you that the Biden administration down there, and they're not giving me enough food stamps. That's the type of mentality these people have. This is the United States of America. Those coal mine towns in Kentucky and West Virginia and all these places that are rural and poverty and drug addiction and all that crap give Haitians and Guatemalans an opportunity and watch those places turn around.